Take some of these front row seats when they do the food demo. Would you like that to be right up in front? And you could learn and see some experts. Experts. And you can be an expert too later on. First, you have to get. <laughs> um, he's going to do some. Keyboard a little later too. Piano. So far so good. Satir. He's a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. Let's all sing together. Mm -hmm. Does he know how to sing? <laughs> But when when the food demo starts, best seats in the house.
Hey, folks, uh, there's a picture of Paul McCartney. Or is that Paul McCartney sitting there? He's a musician. It's, uh, oh, it's Noel Cleland. He's got a different man. He was not one of the Beatles. No one was not, but just as good. Deck 52. Um, we have an order of business. Order of business, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, order of business. We are shooting Facebook Live. And, um, you know, so in a sense, our Earth Save audience is more like an audience now than just people sitting and watching and, you know, part of an event. But we want to make sure that, well, uh, is there anyone here who's like running from the police? You know, uh, is anyone here an international convict or someone that you, okay, but on a real level, then maybe if you have like any reason, any reason, not just a criminal record or, you know, you're on the most wanted list, but if there's any reason why you don't want to be or to appear on Facebook Live, um, we'll probably, um, I think we're going to have to designate a table in the future if we have people who, you know, don't want their parents to be on Facebook. But is there, if, and I don't mean to, I don't want to embarrass anybody or, but I mean, people have legitimate reasons for not wanting to be, you know, to appear in a video. Um, if anybody does see me, and um, certainly we could um, make a table in the back or somewhere, maybe on the side, so that we will just try to keep the camera there. If you see the camera coming, just go like, you know, like this, you know, the vampire sign or something like that. Or get some carrot masks, different veggie masks. We could have carrot, we could give you a carrot mask so that you'll be unidentifiable other than just like a vegetable or maybe a fruit or a grain. Anonymous brain person or fruit person. <laughs> yeah, and Linda certainly could make you a custom uh, disguise. Apparently, no one is averse to this, so Facebook will freely be posting. By the way, let me smile. Camera. Okay, and um, the cam you might you may see the camera just kind of drifting around and. Don't be self-conscious. Uh, if your agent wants to cut a deal, well, you know, you can call and try to cut the best deal possible. But otherwise, uh, don't think about it. Okay, um, we're gonna have some more music. Do you know that our two chefs graduated tonight? Julian and Karina have completed their apprenticeship program and um, they worked hard. Tonight they're getting their certificates and coincidentally, the very first graduate of Chef Estella's apprenticeship program was Carlos. Um, Carlos, where are you? There he is. And so, it, it, it's just amazing. Can you believe that he graduated one year ago tomorrow? So, I mean, I thought it was going to be ultra cool where it's like exactly one year, but it's pretty close, right? So, tomorrow will be his one year of being a graduate plant-based chef and adopting and um, incorporating the healthy vegan lifestyle, especially the live food. The live food is probably the best part of the healthy vegan diet. It's got all the best of the best, the goodest of the good, and the greatest of the great nutrients. But anyway, a little more um, eating, music, and then we're going to have Esto, Nemo. Demonstration of 
some of the greatest, if not the greatest, beverage on the planet. Take my, don't take my word for it, you'll find out. Okay. 
Okay, so if you will, um, uh, eyes forward, because right now, Karina has a 40-day program that, this is day 40 or 40 plus, she's already, she's already graduated, and, um, And um, on our website is her really um, remarkable like, statement that she made. Um, it's too long to memorize, I think. You didn't memorize it, I didn't. So it, it'll be on our website, it'll be available for your friends and everything else, but it's in black and white or maybe in a colored font, so like green font or something. Um, and so we are Chef Estella is presenting the certificate to Karina, um, and uh, we hope that this apron is going to be put to very good use. It says, saving the world one bite at a time. Our slogan really works on an apron, right? Congratulations. Congratulations. some photos, we ask you to share it with Ursaid. We have a link. You can just go to the link. It's it's on the Google Drive and just drop, paste it, you know, drop and drag your photos or video clips. Um, if you just ask for the link, I'll give it to you by text or email or it's on our website. It's on everywhere. So please share the photos that you take tonight. Um, we're getting set up for a demo, and um, on my left is Dr. Flora. Many of you know Dr. Flora already. How many people know Dr. Flora's doctor? I say it that way because Dr. Flora, I think it's safe to say you were privileged. You always say you were privileged, and it, it, almost anybody would say that if they were working as Dr. Ann Wigmore's personal assistant right over here, day in, day out, learning everything that Dr. Ann Wigmore, okay, Dr. Ann Wigmore, 
who technically invented wheatgrass, Dr. Ann Whitmore. Well, she didn't invent wheatgrass. It was the first grass that appeared on Earth and created, virtually created the entire mammal species because we like grass and green things. But Dr. Whitmore perfected the, the incredible healing, curative properties and um, taught how to regain health and maintain health with wheatgrass and some of wheatgrass's best friends, like rejuvelac and some other goodies. Oh, oh, we're going to be ready in a few minutes, right? Estella, we're ready in a few minutes for this. We have a machine. And, I, and as soon as we're ready, I'm going to here. This demo um, is one of our live food demos every month. And we have wonderful guest chefs and nutritionists, people who have a, a restaurant or a business or, you know, coaching. And they're teaching everyone how to make live food goodies. But as I said, I don't think I'm biased, but energy soup may have saved my life more than once. And if it didn't save my life, it really pulled me up. Uh, when I was really in trouble a couple of times, um, Dr. Flora has used it to literally save many people's lives. It's, it's not a joke, and of course not a joke, but there are millions and millions and millions of web hits when you talk about green smoothies. That's the popular and awesome beverage that can change our civilization around. But probably of all the green drinks, energy soup is the queen of, of, all, of all drinks. It's, okay. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Can I have your undivided attention now, please? Can I have your undivided attention now, please? I have the honor to do a demo, a live food demo with Dr. Flora. Dr. Flora Mason Van Orden worked with Dr. Ann Whitmore for over 22 years in Boston and Puerto Rico, and is certified by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, author of the China Study, from E. Cornell in Plant-Based Nutrition, at the Showtime University Medical Center, in the world recognized in, in the nutrition medical practice at FIU during the holistic holiday at Sea Cruises. She's a world-recognized authority in cell regeneration through enzyme nutrition and autolization. That means fermentation of starches. Uh, with you, Dr. Flora. on just a regular vegetarian or vegan diet under the table. 
when I went on the holistic holiday at the sea cruise. Where did you get your energy? Well, Estella is going to show you where I got my energy. Got my energy from electricity. More than 2,000 years ago, people were using chlorophyll for the moon. And we forgot we only need between 8 or 9 percent protein, not something that's hanging over a plate. Or two or three cups of beans. I just love beans. And in the winter time, I do eat some cooked food. But one of the things that, if you just want to give it a try for a week or two, that Dr. Wigmore taught me was to please think about summertime. God gives us an opportunity to clean our bodies out from all winter, the nine months of being cool and having to be inside, especially at north. Down here we're luckier. But if you die in the hospital, what happens? They put an electric paddle on you to shock you back to life because they know that electricity is what makes your diaphragm work. It's not so much your heart. They're shocking the diaphragm back so that your lungs will fill up, your diaphragm will push, and then your heart will start beating. Electricity. Electricity is not in anything that's been cooked at 100 and above 110 degrees. Dr. Wigmore and I traveled all over the world together, and we carried little bags that are no larger than what you see over there. And in the summertime, June, July, and August, we didn't eat anything that was cooked, um, anything that was processed. We just ate fruit and some raw seeds that had been made into seed cheeses, nut cheeses. Mm -hmm. But this is where you get your energy right now. If we were outside picking these wonderful mangoes that are just beginning to fall off the trees down here in Florida, and this is such a glorious time. Um, I can't tell you how much I love living down here. Um, I chose, I had a chance to choose any place in the world to retire, and here is where it is. Um, Estella will show you what we're going to do. The soft spring wheat berries. A lot of people have never even heard of these. They've heard of the hard red winter wheat that bread is made out of. But the soft spring wheat berries was one of the things that caused Dr. Wigmore to get Nobel recognition uh, for this cell regeneration through enzyme therapy. When you soak these, the gluten completely disappears. What's made is a fermented drink that will make depression disappear has all the B-complex vitamins, anti-stress vitamins in it. Tastes a little bit like sour lemonade. It's so easy, it makes itself. Uh, if anybody's interested, I, we will have recipes here for you, and all you have to do is write to me. I will hook you up with the recipe and send you a copy of it. Uh, my email address is on. Uh, if somebody wants to take it down, we have uh, a sign-up sheet here. These are organic figs. This is organic flax seed. This is Dult, the most wonderful seed vegetable. It has all the minerals and trace minerals. People do not get sick because of a lack of vitamins. They get sick because of a lack of minerals. One tablespoon of dolls a day is all you need. Here's the 
wonderful almond cream. For everybody in here, you only need about two ounces of concentrated protein a day. And this is one of the best sources. 12 almonds soaked overnight to get rid of this tannic acid, which is what you tan your shoe leather with. You don't want that in your body. So always soak your almonds. And Glazer Farm has a very special place that will give us almonds that are raw. Really raw because all the rest of them are, are not raw. This is one of my favorites. Red cabbage. This is from Glazer. They make it uh, according to my specifications, God bless them, uh, with a ceramic knife because this is so sensitive that it will react with uh, a metal knife. So you don't ever put a metal spoon in here. Do not ever want to put a spoon in here that's been in your mouth because it's a libel of uh, make it disappear. But this is one one of the ingredients, the Jubilac, that is made with the spring soft white pastry wheat berries. You can see it looks a little bit like dirty dish water. That's what we put in salt it. Excuse me, Dr. Clara, Dr. Clara, can you repeat what is that, the water, the dairy water? <laughs> <laughs> that is the, the fabulous Rejubilac. Fermented. This is uh, fermented. And these two are two of the fermented foods that uh, got Dr. Wigmore Nobel recognition. Um, wonderful watermelon. Now, you'll notice that we have the white in here too. If you went to the Ann Wigmore Institute in Boston, at either 196 Commonwealth Avenue or later on, um, you know, earlier on at 25 Exeter Street, you will find for breakfast three pitchers of various colors of watermelon juice. And people would come from all over the world and they'd sit and look and say, watermelon juice for breakfast? They had no idea what was going to happen to them the next uh, three or four hours after they learned how to chew that watermelon juice as if it was a solid. So everything that you are making that is juiced, be sure to keep it in the front of your mouth and chew it at least for 30, min 30 times, excuse me, before uh, you swallow it. Because the vitamins go in the roof of your mouth, the minerals go in under your tongue. And uh, there are a lot of other things that happen in your mouth too. Uh, it's just very exciting how our brains can just be on fire from eating foods like that. Um, we have broccoli sprouts. Broccoli is a big name, but the sprouts are the only ones that have been given a seal of approval by Harvard for being a cancer preventive. So make sure that you have some broccoli sprouts. And they're, so, they're so easy to make yourself. Baby greens. The last two years of Dr. Whitmore's life, she used only weeds from her garden uh, down in Puerto Rico. This is lamb's quarter. This is what you call Mayo energy. If you want to give it a speech, if you want to be really focused, if you're going to win a race or win a contest, make sure you have some lamb's quarter. It will grow probably as eight feet tall if it's allowed to. This is purslane. It's very interesting that Monsanto is uh, is having fits over pigweed. This is another name for purslane right now. Gaia or Mother Earth is making this sprout all over the place to give us back in our soil the energy that it needs. Beautiful. These weeds will only grow when the soil is so depleted and so full of um, oil from the sprays, from the insecticide, <coughs> pesticide, um, all this stuff. Little 
solvents come out of the ends of the rootlets. Dr. Woodmore saw this in an electron microscope from in Harvard, and it neutralizes all of the negativity in the soil. So these are so valuable, along with um, all the weeds that you know from your own countries, those of you who are, I've traveled all over the world, and everybody has a form of dandelion. Everybody has a form of all different kinds of weeds that their grandmothers have taught them about. Please keep up this knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the first thing yes. that Estella, Chef Estella, is going to do is she's going to put in some rejuvelac. Yes, I'm going to put one cup of rejuvelac. Now I'm going to add, if you follow the recipe, the two cups already measure of watermelon plants whether the dolls <coughs> seaweed already sprouted already rinsed. So you soak the seed in dual side. Dolls. D D U L S E dolls. Okay. Dolls. It's a sea vegetable. Right, right, right. Now <coughs> yeah. please do not use kelp. The other name for kelp is combo or laver, and we have found out um, since 1944 uh, when the Americans found that the Japanese prisoners in Guam were using a certain seaweed to uh, make their their rice scrumptious. This is what monosodium glutamate is. So it's really, really important for you not to use that anymore because it actually, according to um, <coughs> research, it will destroy parts of your brain that, that uh, allow you to learn things. You cannot retrieve things that you have already learned. Kelp. What is that? No, is that? Yes. No kelp. What about the other name is combo. What about
that lead is like corn. The way you, it goes in, it comes out. So you really need to grind it up. Very famous doctor, uh, baby doctor, did a lot of work. Now I have that's number three. She is fine too. Is it to that black them? seed is. Uh, they need to be soaked. Or, or sprouting is even better. Yes. And now I'm going to add the two cups of herb meat. Yes. I'll say herbs. No, okay. no. What about the iodine? Uh, there's plenty of iodine in delta. There's actually more iodine in kelp than you need. But don't you say don't use kelp. You stole. What about the liquid iodine drops? Uh -huh. uh, it's isolated and much. Better. It's much better to have it as a whole. Thank you. Yes. With regard to the dulse and just any of the seaweeds, are you concerned about the contamination in the water? Because that's yes, something that I've been hearing a lot. So how do you how do you combat that? Is there a way to purify it, or is there a way to strip out the toxins? Yeah, the dulse is from the real northern waters. But even the waters in uh, Washington State and in uh, Maine are contaminated now. And everything is probably from Fukushima at this point. Yep. That's why it's important to eat the CV because of the iodine. It's a protective effect. What about the radiation? Yeah, that's good. Those also have the calcium it has all the fluoride. <coughs> now I'm um, adding mm -hmm. the herb mix. Dr. Flora said no spinach or watercress for this recipe. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to ask, why no spinach? Yeah. such a popular green is because of its the content of iron. But unfortunately there is a substance in there that binds the iron to spinach. You cannot get any of the iron that's in spinach and it causes anemia and it actually it precipitates gallstones. Really? So, uh, How about moringa? Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's good for iron. That's good for iron. But, uh, after a certain age, we don't really need much on it. So you have to... Yeah, these are 
Uh, pea greens, your sunflower baby greens. Crazy. These are pea green sprouts and sunflower. Sprouts mixed with the baby. They're so simple to grow in just seven days. You see the sunflower. Everybody's pushing sprouts nowadays, but it's really important for you to know that on the seventh day of the sprouting experience, the little things change their electrical uh, force from a positive ionization to negative ionization. And we have negative ions in our environment when we take a shower or we're out at the beach. And this is what makes us just be charged with energy. And uh, uh, we feel wonderful. So you don't want to hang out in an environment uh, like one young lady did up in Boston who was wondering why she felt so sad all the time. And it was because the baby sprouts under seven days old were <coughs> sucking the energy away from her. And, uh, so, Raise your little sprouts until they're seven days old, cut them off, and then we'll show you how to do that in the first time if you want. Okay, so let's Now I have to feed Thank you. 
table is a picture of myself and um, Dr. Neil Bernard, who's the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. That's 5,000 medical doctors and 100,000 lay people who are all vegan. And these people are researching.
get into the process. Yeah. post on the website or on Facebook. Wow, 26 people. You put a video? 80, 100, now we're up to over 200 on the site. It's like, okay. The guy, did you hear that the guy that I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm
Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, while we're getting set up, cinco minutos, does anyone know it? Five minutes, we're gonna be feature presentation, which is really awesome. But meanwhile, Satir, is the piano in tune? We've got a special treat tonight because Satir is not just uh, a guitarist.
rusty, but not, no rust is on there. Can you ask who made the energy ball so I can ask okay, let's show their this. name? We have a, a, a request. Somebody made energy balls. You're after. Let's see. Your afternoon pick me up. Okay, can we have the uh, the author of this dish step forward? Can the author of that dish step forward? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. This is not an ordinary lecture. This is not an ordinary presentation. Karen Ellis Ritter, <clears throat> Karen and her husband Joshua, By the way, whoever was looking for that recipe, the pick-me-up, it was Dr. Vargas. There she is, Dr. Vargas. Um, now, um, as I said, we have some great presentations here on a monthly basis. What Karen and Joshua have done through their organization, Compassionate Farm Animal Initiative and Education Initiative is exceptional in and of itself, but they came up with a project which is to benefit farmed animals that escape, are rescued, um, or given over to animal sanctuaries. Um, this is such a world-class piece of work that they've done with a gentleman named Neil Cohn in New York. I'm not going to get this over there. Um, but they can tell you a lot better than I can. So, Karen. And by the way, Karen has done presentations here at Ursay not once, not twice. We're, we're heading for the big numbers, but... Every one of them is great. Sorry. So you Thank you. Thanks. Um, so um, he's getting this set up, and um, we're going to be showing a documentary <coughs> that our team put together. Um, before I do that, I want to introduce our organization. Uh, my name is Karen Ellis Ritter. I am co-founder of the Compassionate Farming Education Initiative. Um, we are a vegan education nonprofit, and we promote a plant-based global agriculture model because it is an imperative for our planet that we shift away from animal products because they are the leading disruptor of the environment, of our psyches, of our spirits, and certainly the most destructive force against animal species. So. Um, we promote this through education and outreach, and we access online and open source materials. Um, there are so many beautiful, important grassroots organizations that already exist that have created wonderful materials. So what we've done is we've created a giant, um, almost like an encyclopedia of all the best resources on the internet um, so that you can go there and look for whatever topic relates to veganism and find the information that you want. So, if you're brand new to you know to this whole thing and you have never even heard of veganism and you just want to learn, um, there's books and there's documentaries and there's amazing you know articles and things like that. We have um, listings of where you can purchase things retail online. Um, we've got you know fitness, health, every single category that relates to veganism. We have just a whole host of resources. And um, one of our partners, Dory over there, she's working with me to develop the quintessential resource. Um, we're moving our website over, and very shortly you're gonna be able to, you know, keyword search absolutely anything you can imagine. We have 
thousands and thousands and thousands of resources. So it's going to be very easy to find things by keyword. We also have um, a, a U.S. directory of farm sanctuaries by state. Um, I could not recommend more that every person on this planet visit a farm sanctuary and get to know these majestic animals. Um, you know, if anyone's ever had like a rescue dog or cat in their home, um, you see this gratitude, this reverence, and um, this companionship that is beyond compare. And when you go to a sanctuary, where a lot of these animals came from abuse situations, you'll, you'll experience, you know, much of the same thing, only with animals that, you know, you've never had exposure to. So Josh will talk more about the project itself, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a background about what we do. Um, we're doing, we're, we're developing several different workshops right now. For those of you who are seasoned advocates, um, we're going to be running out a beta of a workshop called um, Advanced Targeted Advocacy Techniques. And um, it's basically about reconnecting to your original purpose how you became a vegan um, and what inspired you, and kind of clearing out, <coughs> excuse me, clearing out things that hold you back psychologically, um, you know, just kind of being present with people and, and being a more effective advocate. Um, we're also going to be doing a vegan startup 101, like helping people to bulk prep, how to um, shop vegan on a budget, how to go vegan instantly, like ways to just, you know, instantaneously take what you're eating cooking right now and then you know just take out the animal products and put in you know the plant-based alternatives until you start to gradually learn what's really out there and there are thousands and thousands of options. Um, so yeah we're trying to just basically cover all the bases and anything that has not already been created we are going to find you know a, a way to fill in the gaps. But there's so much great stuff out there, and you can just go to one place. You can go to compassionatefarming.org. Um, there's a lot more information over here. And you can go to our resources section and find everything you could ever want to know about veganism. Um, we're also being sponsored by Vegan Rob's. They make absolutely amazing snacks. Um, they're gluten-free, they're vegan, and they're really clean ingredients. So we're giving out samples um, along with some of our, you know, our materials so that you can see what we're about. Um, and all we ask is if you could just sign our mailing list. We maybe send out three or four emails a year. We're pretty much just letting you know what projects we're working on, um, what festivals we're going to be at, or what you know events are coming up. Um, so please do so, and feel free to take and enjoy. And um, we also have CDs for sale, which Josh will talk about, um, and t-shirts, buttons, stickers, and everything goes to the nonprofit and to farm sanctuaries. Thank you. Here's my husband, Josh. Hello, hello. So yeah, as Karen said, as Jeff mentioned, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this project that our partner Neil Cohn started up in New York a couple of years ago. He had the idea <laughs> of you know what's a great way to uh, to reach the masses with the message of vegan lifestyle, animal rights, vegetarianism, all these things. Uh, it's such an important thing. So what's what's a great way to reach people who would be totally uninitiated otherwise? And he's a musician, and he had the idea, well, maybe to do an album of a compilation of vegan, vegetarian uh, musicians. And he had this idea, and he said, well, what we could do is we could you know, put this together, sell it as a CD or download card, and proceeds could be donated to farm sanctuaries. As Karen mentioned, farm sanctuaries are wonderful uh, places for these typically farmed animals to be able to live their lives out in a free and natural way. And that's something that often they get rescued from factory farms, sometimes they're left for dead, sometimes farmers, you know, if they're sick, they won't uh, get the veterinary care they need because it's just not worth the money. And uh, what, what the great thing is, they these chickens, pigs, goats, cows, they live out their lives in a very natural way. Uh, and the best part is, is that people get an opportunity to visit the farm sanctuaries. They start seeing these animals in a completely different light. Suddenly, they're not just a slab of meat on the plate. Suddenly, it's not just a glass of milk. Suddenly, these are real animals with joy and with anxiety and with love and not so different than canines and felines. So, uh, so, we had, so he had this idea and uh, he reached out to a lot of uh, independent artists, but he also reached out to some more familiar artists. Uh, and everybody 
agreed to donate a track onto this album, most of which are exclusive tracks you can't hear anywhere else but on this album. And some of the names you might uh, recognize, Yoko Ono is on the album, Moby, uh, Chrissy Hine and the Pretenders, Joan Jett, and uh, Howard Jones, Nellie Mackay, a lot of fabulous people. So the album's here, it's 17 artists, 22 different tracks, and uh, we have it over here uh, on our table here. I encourage you to take a look. I'm gonna show you a short documentary right now. What it's really about is the making of this album, and, you know, how it was put together, why it was put together, and talks a little bit about CFEI and the basic concept of uh, philosophy behind the organization. So we're gonna put that on right now, and then uh, afterwards, if you have any questions or you wanna learn more, please visit us, visit us at the table. You can talk to me or Karen or Dory, and uh, you know, take a look at this, the literature, the things we have, and sign the email list. And uh, thank you, uh, Earthsay, very much for having us here tonight. One more quick thing. I just want to say that um, the proceeds for the album sales go to uh, Catskill Animal Sanctuary, which is actually <coughs> featured on this documentary, Woodstock Animal Sanctuary, uh, Kindred Spirits here in Ocala, Florida, and also Happy Trails in Ohio. Um, so all of those sanctuaries benefit from these sales. And also, um, we have digital downloads for $10, and we have the CDs for $15. And we also take cards. Do, you have, do we have any sanctuaries here in the South Florida area? Any of the farm sanctuaries you mentioned? Unfortunately, there really, uh, there aren't many of, of the sanctuaries here. There is one in Miami, I think it's called Earth Sanctuary. It's not a vegan sanctuary, because they sell eggs. So, um, but, but it does have a lot of animals there. Um, and they do get to live their lives out. So it's not a vegan sanctuary, but it's a sanctuary. So if you want that experience, you know, I still highly recommend going. Are you talking about Earth and Us Farm? Earth and Us Farm, yes. Right. Oh, okay. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Little Haiti. Huh? 7340 Northeast 2nd Avenue. Love and Vegetable. Something like that. Yeah, Love okay. and Vegetable. Love and Vegetable. Yeah, I mean, they're a wonderful place. I'm not, you know, that wasn't putting them down. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, our organization, you know, most promotes vegan sanctuaries, but, you know, I still strongly encourage people to go.
introduce the plight of farm animals and then get the word out through the use of the music and the musicians themselves. I love to combine music and animal advocacy. Uh, it's, you know, there's so many horrors uh, when you're dealing with animal rights, but to have anything to lighten the load or energize people, and that's what the movement needs. If we're going to solve things, we need that energy. Sometimes, you know, the choir needs a song or two, too. I first uh, became a vegetarian because I, I was doing yoga at Jiva Mukti Yoga Studio, and uh, over there they're uh, really big on animal rights. And they kept saying, you know, you can practice this by not killing animals and um, eating them. And I, at the time, I thought I never could do that because I was so addicted to meat. I started seeing the videos of like what factory farming is doing and all that, and I was just like, oh god, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I love animals like too much, and I thought like, what's the difference between like loving a dog and then loving like a cow? So that's when I, I stopped. I saw a film, and it was about how they process uh, baby chickens in the factory, and I'll never forget seeing that. I had no idea that animals were treated that way. They were just baby chicks. It really made me think, if that's what they do to those animals, what do they do to other animals? And what's the difference between chickens and goats and pigs and cows and animals that people have in their homes that they take care of? Cats, dogs, parrots, all the animals are the same. One of the guys that I was in a band with was vegetarian, so I kind of went to him and asked, tell me about being a vegetarian. I'm really, you know, interested. How do I get started? I remember there was one time we were sitting around the kitchen table, I was getting ready for dinner, and asked my mother uh, what fish fingers were made of. I think a lot of kids, they have that moment, and it gets railroaded, that you're supposed to grow up with Care Bears and My Little Pony, and then, you know, you're supposed to accept the horrors that happen to animals. And, and People are completely confused by these two things. Even when you're an adult, it's completely confused that some animals are companions and some you eat. A lot of people in this country they have dogs and cats and pets, and their pet is like a member of their family. I mean, they love them, they sleep with them, they cuddle with them, and they can't imagine their lives without them. And it's ironic because those same people very readily, you know, eat meat from a cow, or chicken. And there's a disconnect there. And I believe one of the reasons for this is because people just haven't had the opportunity to have personal experience with these animals. And if they did, they would realize that these animals are just as capable of forming those same bonds as they form with their canine counterparts and their feline counterparts. When people have access to that, when they visit a farm sanctuary and they see these beautiful, complex creatures and they start bonding with them and making connections with them, and start to look at the relationship they had with their pets and compare it to the relationship they could have with these other animals as well. I love birds, and so like I definitely love chickens and turkeys. I just think birds are so smart and they're so loving and they really know what's going on like way more than anybody gives them credit for. It's unbelievable. Home on the Ranch is a flagship project. What we're going to be making for this project is going to be going towards farm sanctuaries. And the reason this is important is because farm sanctuaries are a haven for animals who've been neglected, abused, or left to die. And this can happen in uh, animal agriculture environment. It can be uh, neglect from personal owners. Sometimes they're just sort of left to starve. Sometimes they just don't have the medical attention they need. These places um, pull animals that have been down or fall sick, and they get to live their lives out in freedom and peace. And the best part of it is people, you know, get to go and meet animals that they've never had contact with. People get to deeply connect with pigs and chickens and cows and really understand that they're just like us. It's pretty beautiful. And this is why farm sanctuaries exist. This is why they're so important. And they really stand for everything that we stand for. Cattail Animal Sanctuary is a 100 acre sanctuary for abused, abandoned, discarded farm animals. We take 12 species from rabbits to horses. We have a three part mission. And the first is to do life and death rescue of these 12 species, bring them back to physical and psychological health. 
the Senate is to use innovative educational programming to raise public awareness of agribusiness and what it's doing to all living things, including the planet. And the third is to be a resource to the community, so we provide a lot of programming to schools, particularly in underserved communities. Good educational experiences should change us for the better. And nobody was doing the education in the way I felt it needed to be done. So from that to really consciously identifying my passions and trying to synthesize them into something, Catskill Island Sanctuary was the word.
factory farm is a deplorable and horrible life. There's tons of abuse, but aside from that, there's no access to natural light. There's no access to fresh air. Overcrowded situations uh, cause, at the very least, horrible stress, uh, fear, anxiety, all the same things that humans suffer. These animals are experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis and ending with horrible death. Over time, I became much more informed about the dairy industry, um, factory farming, and the horrific conditions and practices that most people just accept as a necessary reality. Behind that, there's a real story of an animal that was just that just wanted to live. That was their life. And the bottom line is, there's no necessity for it. You can thrive without doing that. And if people actually took the time to get to know a pig or a chicken or a cow, they would see an intelligent, sentient being that wants to live. There's not a single animal that will get down on its knees and it will give its life to you. Their lives are forcibly taken away. Also, I think for a lot of people, there's a detached deniability that those conditions even exist at all. So I gradually became vegan. The biggest tragedy of all of this is that it's not necessary. We like to think that it's necessary and that's why it continues, but it's not necessary. When people transition to a plant-based diet, we can start changing those conditions because there will be no need for them anymore. I hope people feel about this place that the love here is disarming. Our job from the first moment they pull into the parking lot is to say with everything we do, whether it's the nutrition they need or how we approach a fearful animal, which is always to get them on the ground. Potato chips, 
Hi, Thomas. Hi, Falafel. Smoothies. Love making smoothies. Amazing plant based cheeses, plant based meats, plant based desserts. And those great salad places where you can go in and you can mix and match your own salad and there's a base price and it's, it's affordable and, and you can have as much as you like. And I love those places. On the internet, there's just a million different recipes and so many yummy options. So if you want to like have some long-term success, you need to do things gently and without a lot of judgment either. And I say take it slow, be compassionate with yourself. I really love all the new junk foods they're making in the health food store. It's my favorite reason to go to the health food store, all the junk food. So many choices. And most stores, grocery stores, online stores, sell these items, and it's easy to get now. I actually find that now, as a vegan, I'm eating way more or way interesting, unusual foods than I ever did before that. So there are just a million reasons to do it. The sort of options we have available are incredible. There's vegan versions of chicken, fish, beef, cheese. You don't have to give up any of your comfort foods. You just get a plant-based version of it. I try not to stress the health benefits so much with moving to a vegetarian and vegan diet because when people adopt that diet for reasons of faddishness or trendiness uh, or narcissism, they're much less likely to stick to it than if they do it for reasons of empathy and compassion. So whether it's through giving money or buying a CD or volunteering your time or fostering an animal. There's so many ways that people can be a part of this support. This is Nellie Mackay. Please support CFEI's Home on the Range. Hi, this is Princess Superstar. That's Siren. Thank you for supporting CFEI's Home on the Range. Please support CFEI's Home on the Range. Okay, thank you very much. So that was a little documentary there. And there's a little, little music video we're going to call up here in a minute, but uh, does anybody have any questions off the top of their head right now? Yes? Um, and, and from a vegan perspective, 
we're, we're not for breeding animals, purposefully breeding animals. Um, you know, we're trying to keep populations down and we're trying to give the ones who are alive every single benefit that can be afforded to them. So he'd be hard pressed to find a sanctuary that would be okay with keeping them intact. So I, I don't know what to say. I mean, there's definitely, you know, sanctuaries in most states and you can um, go on our website in the resources section, the sanctuary section, and you can look by state and you can contact them individually. But um, that would be my assumption that nobody would um, be cool with that. So. Yes? So, um, I mean, if they want to be listed as a resource, we can always add them, and that could garner exposure. Um, I mean, unfortunately, what's going on with the horses is the animal agriculture industry is driving wild indigenous animals out of their lands that they were born in to make more room for grazing cattle. So this is a problem that won't stop until they stop you know, animal, animal production. So it's really rough because I know I've, I've actually spoken to people on the Bureau of Land Management because it, it's, it is, it's a contentious issue. And I said, you know, like, well, what can be done? Obviously, what we ideally like to happen is for people to stop the demand for meat and then, you know, these animals could inhabit their indigenous land. But that's not gonna happen anytime immediately. So they wind up, you know, housed in these little burrows and they're confined and then eventually they get slaughtered because there's too many and the budget keeps getting slashed. So I understand the, the frustration and I think it's wonderful that they're trying to, you know, rescue these animals and rehabilitate them. And they definitely do need, you know, they need grant support and they need, you know, networking. So if they want to reach out to us, we can always list them as a resource because we have an organization's um, list in our resources section because we really do want to promote grassroots efforts to rescue animals and, and save them. So yeah, you can just, um, you know, take a card and, you know, give them my info. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. And feel free to take snacks up on that tall table.